Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Cardiology Grand Rounds. Um, before we get started, many of you know and love Christina Redmond, and many of you know today is going to be her last day at University of Washington. So before we get started, Dr. Daniel Fishbein is going to say a few words about her. Thanks, Richard. Um, it's a pleasure, and it's also uh, with some sadness that I want to acknowledge Christina um, and talk a little bit about her. So um, all of you know, Christina has worked in, with the heart failure and transplant section for a long time. But she actually started at the university in 2003, and she was hired. She was working with um, Larry Dean and Doug Stewart in the cath lab. And then we were fortunate enough to recruit her to our service. And she's been taking care of patients with advanced heart failure, VAD patients, and also post-transplant patients. Um, it's been a real pleasure to see Christina develop into the mature, really superb clinician that, that she is. Um, Christina is known for knowing her patients' medical problems, but also knowing her patients as people. She's developed these long lasting relationships, positive relationships with her patients. And she's really beloved um, by her patients. It, it's great to see her um, interact with, particularly post-transplant patients. Um, she's well known for being unflappable and you have to be, take care of these patients long-term. I told the story yesterday, but a typical Christina event would be to come out of the patient's room and say, you know, Dan, I have to talk to you what's going on? And she'd say, you know, this patient, you know, got some tonic on the internet and started to take it and hasn't taken their immunosuppression for three months. Um, and she just smiled and say, you know, what do you think? And then we'd go on and figure out what to do with the patient. But um, that reflects, I think, her maturity and calm in, in caring for patients. Um, she's a really great patient advocate. Um, she's incredibly committed. She's um, empathetic. Um, uh, I'm, I'm smiling because one of our uh, staff described her as a Julian. Um, and I think, you know, that means cheerful and energetic. And we are going to miss that very positive energy that she brings uh, to work every day. Um, she's actually beloved by her patients and also her colleagues. And, and we're going to miss her uh, terribly. Um, having said that, she's going on to, to work as a uh, to develop a heart failure uh, clinic in Bellevue with a very good group. Um, I think she'll bring all the knowledge that she has and all the energy that she has to that group. Um, I know the people she's going to be working with and they're a terrific group of people. Um, and I think we all really wish her well, wish her the best um, uh, going forward. And my hope would be that we continue to interact as colleagues as we consult and work together um, with the patients she's taking care of. So. Um, in short, um, thank you and really best wishes, Christina. Thank you. And, and I just want to echo um, the same sentiments that um, Dan has expressed about Christina. I, she's one of the first APPs I met when I came to University of Washington. She's been wonderful to work with. I think a really strong testament to how well loved she is, is when all our patients found out she was leaving, every single one of them asked about her when I saw them in clinic and they were all very sad and asked if there was any way we could keep her and instead of having her move across the bridge. Um, regardless, I'm just happy she'll still be close by uh, Overlake and I wish her the best and hope we can continue to work together. Great. So now we're gonna move on and um, introduce our speaker for today, um, Dr. Kyle Feller for today's Ground Rounds. So I have the privilege of introducing Kyle who I know well from working with him closely in clinic during the last year. He completed his undergraduate degree at Villanova before moving to Boston for medical school. He then decided to move to the Pacific Northwest and came to University of Washington for residency. He loved it so much on the West Coast, they decided to stay as a current fellow. Many of you know that next year, he will be moving on to a position at Polyclinic, which is a huge loss for us, but similarly, it will be close by and we will be able to continue working with him. In clinic, we have seen a diversity of cardio-oncology patients, including those with both short and long-term complications from radiation therapy. This can be underrecognized because of its very insidious nature, and it can often present decades after exposure. So today, um, Dr. Feller will educate us on the ins and outs of radiation-induced cardiovascular disease. All right, can you hear me all right? 
Um, thanks, Richard. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, for, for those who don't know me, um, I'm one of the uh, uh, soon to be graduated third year fellows, uh, God willing. Um, today, I wanted to, to you know, review the topic of radiation uh, induced cardiovascular disease, like Richard mentioned. Um, became interested in this after uh, we saw a number of patients with pretty advanced uh, cardiovascular disease at relatively young ages in clinic over the um, past year and thought it would be a, a good topic to review, especially in light of the uh, um, new expert consensus statement uh, recommendations that came out related to this. Um, I apologize in advance if either of my little ones uh, decide to make their presence known in the background. I ran into some laptop issues this morning, so I'm doing this from the, the desktop in the playroom while they're getting ready for school, so uh, apologies. Um, without uh, further ado, we can get started. I have uh, no relevant disclosures. Um, so for the, the learning objectives today, I'll, I'll talk briefly about the, the history of uh, radiation therapy um, and evolution of uh, thoracic radiotherapy techniques. Um, we'll review the associated cardiovascular risks uh, and screening recommendations for um, patients with a history of thoracic radiation. Uh, and at the end, we'll touch on some of the, uh, the management considerations in this uh, uh, population, specifically comparing the, the risks and benefits of both surgical and uh, percutaneous techniques. A little bit of background. Um, radiation therapy was first used to treat cancer all the way back in 1899. Uh, since that time, there's been enormous progress uh, with regard to the effectiveness of this modality and uh, minimization of the uh, treatment side effects. Um, radiation can be used as the, the sole treatment for cancer. It can be given uh, concurrently with systemic chemotherapy, um, or it can be used uh, perioperatively to, to minimize the amount of residual disease um, after treatment. Um, additionally, uh, radiation therapy uh, can be used palliatively uh, when the, the disease is deemed incurable. Um, Increasingly, uh, radiation therapies have uh, been used in combination with uh, surgery and systemic therapies to, to maximize tumor control and quality of life uh, while minimizing the, the toxicity associated with it. Um, Therapeutic radiation has been a—it's uh, become a, a cornerstone uh, of cancer treatment. Um, uh, with more than one half of adult patients now receiving uh, radiation therapy at some point in the course of their treatment, um, it's a, a critical treatment component for multiple thoracic malignancies, including breast, uh, lung, esophageal, gastric, um, as well as certain childhood cancers and lymphomas. Uh, there's been a strong recent emphasis on organ preservation in the, uh, the field of clinical oncology um, after uh, multiple randomized control trials have established uh, equivalent survival outcomes um, between uh, radical, radical um, uh, surgery alone uh, and organ preservation uh, 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 treatment with uh, a radiation therapy backbone. Um, this uh, equivalent outcome that they've seen uh, in better uh, in the uh, better quality of life that's uh, come with the organ preservation therapy has made it a, a very important uh, option for the management of certain um, thoracic cancers. Um, Radiation uh, therapy delivers uh, high ionization energy to a, a specific area um, with the ultimate goal of uh, killing malignancy, uh, malignant cells, um, primarily through double-stranded DNA breaks um, uh, related to the ionization energy. Um, it's important to realize that both the malignant and normal cells are susceptible to the ionizing effects of radiation, uh, but the normal cells are, are better able to repair the damage. Um, that said, normal tissues do have limits on the, the dose of radiation that they can withstand, and, and these limits determine the, the maximum dose that can, uh, that can be safely administered during a course of a, a patient's treatment. Um, in the, in the field of uh, radiation oncology, they use this uh, concept called the therapeutic uh, ratio, which, which boils down to the, the balance between an acceptable probability of um, radiation-induced complication in a normal tissue uh, and the probability of tumor control. 
um, they're able to, to optimize the therapeutic ratio with uh, uh, different dose shaping techniques and by fractionating the dose to allow normal tissues uh, the time to repair the, um, the radiation damage between, uh, between treatments. Um, a variety of uh, uh, radiation techniques are now employed um, and have been developed. Uh, um, the most uh, widely of these used today are uh, uh, external beam radiation, uh, brachytherapy, and uh, uh, different stereotactic techniques. Um, the duration of treatment uh, can range from a, a single treatment to up to eight weeks of daily irradiation. Um, in each uh, clinical scenario, the, the technique, the dose, uh, the, the expected outcomes and the toxicities uh, vary depending on the um, initial diagnosis and the, and the treatment site. Um, despite its uh, obvious uh, positive impact on, on cancer outcomes and survival specifically, um, uh, radiation therapy is uh, associated with both short and long-term uh, adverse effects. Um, a particular note for our discussion today, uh, multiple studies have linked um, radiation therapy to uh, an increased risk of adverse cardiovascular um, uh, effects, uh, leading to increased uh, morbidity and mortality uh, long-term in these uh, cancer survivors. Um, Previously, uh, the heart was uh, uh, considered a, a relatively res uh, radiation resistant organ, um, but uh, um, there's been lots of data examining the, the association of cardiac um, radiation dose and adverse outcomes. Um, and it indicates that there's roughly a, a four to 16% increased um, relative risk of, of heart disease and major cardiac events uh, per gray of mean heart dose of radiation. Um, and there's been no safe uh, dose of radiation that's been identified. Uh, an increasing number of cancer survivors um, are being seen with uh, premature heart disease, despite having no significant um, cardiovascular risk factors, uh, sometimes decades after the, uh, after the completion of their radiation treatments. Um, the first data uh, regarding the effects of radiation on the, on the cardiovascular system actually came from the um, survivors of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, atomic bombings, um, and, and they showed that uh, nearly 10% of the observed group uh, actually eventually died of heart disease. Um, the, the spectrum of radiation-induced cardiovascular disease is broad, um, and at uh, uh, sufficient doses, radiation uh, of the mediastinum can damage virtually any component of the, the heart, including the, the myocardium, the pericardium, uh, valves, uh, coronary arteries, and conduction system. Um, in the world of uh, uh, cardiovascular medicine, we also need to consider the, um, uh, the effects of radiation to the head and neck um, and abdomen and pelvis as well uh, with regard to uh, peripheral vascular disease, uh, dysautonomia, um, hypertension. Uh, the mechanisms of radiation-induced uh, cardiovascular disease are, are very complex, but the, the key aspects are um, DNA damage, uh, oxidative stress, and um, uh, the release of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, which ultimately lead to uh, fibrosis. Um, multiple, multiple studies have shown a, uh, a linear dose-dependent uh, relationship between the mean heart dose delivered and the, uh, the risk of future cardiac, uh, adverse cardiac events. Um, this relationship uh, also holds true with uh, uh, other non-cardiac vascular structures as well. Um, over the past 30 years, uh, there's been significant advances in planning and, and radiation delivery techniques, um, which have reduced uh, uh, the amount of radiation to non-target structures uh, without um, uh, compromising cancer outcomes. Um, prior to the 1970s, uh, there was roughly a, a seven-fold increase in um, cardiovascular death um, in patients who had received radiation therapy for cancer. Um, that number has been reduced to roughly 1.5 to twofold more recently. Um, I'd like to, to highlight uh, two, two cancers in particular uh, where we've seen a drastic change in the way we, we plan for and deliver um, radiation uh, in um, uh, Hodgkin lymphoma and uh, breast cancer. Um, 
dating back to the uh, the 1960s, uh, Dr. Kaplan at Stanford showed that radiation therapy could be potentially curative in early um, early Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, subsequent studies have demonstrated the uh, the re- uh, the relationship between um, mediastinal radiation therapy and the and the risk of fatal cardiovascular complications uh, manifesting anywhere from five to forty years uh, after treatment. Um, that said, much of uh, much of this data was based on patients that were treated with full uh, full mantle fields um, with the initial uh, standard curative dose of forty to forty four gray. Um, as data on the, the late cardiac effects of radiation therapy accumulated, um, simultaneous efforts focused on, uh, on uh, reducing the amount and distribution of radiation therapy to non-target structures um, while maintaining the, uh, the improved cancer outcomes. Um, more effective chemotherapy options, uh, advances in imaging, um, improved staging and uh, response assessment uh, in data on patterns of um, relapse have all uh, paved the way for more limited fields and volumes. Excuse me. Um, Radiation doses uh, more recently uh, for Hodgkin lymphoma have uh, decreased to as low as 20 gray. Um, And the treatment field size, um, uh, decrease from the extended field uh, mantle um, radiation, which you see on the left, um, to involve node and involve site radiation. Um, additionally, there's been uh, advancements in the, the planning and the del- delivery of the radiation uh, with prior, uh, previously we used uh, two-dimensional uh, techniques and those have been replaced by uh, three-dimensional planning and, and more focused proton beam therapy. Um, uh, they also use, now use uh, um, deep inspiration breath holds, uh, which can further reduce the heart doses by uh, elongating the uh, mediastinal structures and displacing the heart outside of the field of view. Um, the, uh, these and the adoption of daily imaging uh, guidance um, have decreased the typical mean heart dose uh, from 25 to 30 gray to less than 5 gray, as you can see in that um, in the chart at the bottom right. Um, moving on to, to breast cancer, in the early decades of uh, radiation therapy, the, the field design was based on um, patient contours uh, in bony uh, anatomic borders that were identified using x-ray. Um, measurements of uh, target coverage and doses to adjacent organs were not uh, possible um, during that 2D, 2D era. Um, uh, with breast cancer, there was a, a slower adaptation to the 3D um, contour-based uh, planning techniques that we saw with Hodgkin's um, in the, uh, the earliest stages of use were in the, the early 2000s. Um, in modern, modern radiotherapy, a, a range of other options exist as well, including uh, prone positioning, uh, the deep inspiration breath holds. Um, and then partial breast radiation is also an option now uh, using uh, brachytherapy and proton beam therapy. Um, in aggregate, the, these changes have reduced the, the mean heart dose to less than one gray, even on uh, less sided uh, breast cancers. So how do we identify which patients are at risk for um, developing radiation-induced cardiovascular disease? Um, The two most important uh, determinants are uh, the individual patient's underlying uh, cardiovascular risk um, and the dose of radiation therapy delivered to the cardiovascular structures. Um, First, uh, the baseline patient characteristics uh, have a substantial impact um, on the the subsequent development of cardiovascular complications. Um, Pre-existing cardiovascular disease, uh, younger age at the time of radiation, uh, in the presence of other um, uh, cardiac risk factors such as hypertension, dyslipidemia, diabetes, family history um, of coronary disease, uh, active smoking or inactivity, um, uh, also all increase the, the risk of uh, developing radiation-induced cardiovascular disease. 
um, as, a, as an example, there was uh, uh, one retrospective uh, single center uh, study to show that uh, patients with known cardiovascular disease, and they included patients that had um, just incidentally found cor uh, coronary calcium on staging CTs, um, had a sevenfold increase uh, in uh, uh, major adverse cardiac events. Um, finally, uh, for reasons that are, are still a bit unclear, women tend to um, uh, have more cardiovascular events and mortality uh, compared with men um, with uh, uh, radiation-induced cardiovascular disease. Um, the, the total dose of mediastinal radiation received um, is, the, is the other major risk factor for the subsequent development of cardiovascular disease. Um, although the, the complications can be seen with, with any dose, there is a, a linear increase in the risk of valvular heart disease uh, with total doses of uh, radiation above uh, 30 gray. Um, other treatment factors, including the, um, uh, the fractionated dose, uh, the volume of the heart uh, irradiated, and the, the, extent, uh, the extent to which the, the coronary arteries were included in the radiation uh, field all come into play. Um, complications are, are more commonly seen uh, in patients, additionally with left-sided breast cancer rather than um, right-sided breast cancer. Um, and then uh, concomitant uh, uh, use of uh, cardiotoxic uh, chemotherapy um, agents further increase the, the, uh, the risk of heart disease as well. Um, for the rest of the talk, we'll be focusing uh, a bit more on the, the different cardiovascular complications, uh, the most recent screening uh, recommendations, and, and certain specific treatment considerations for these patients. Um, so coronary disease is uh, far and away the, the most common manifestation of um, uh, radiation-induced cardiovascular disease with an incidence of up to, to 85%. Um, it can have a, a wide spectrum of presentations ranging from asymptomatic disease to angina uh, to ACS or even a fatal MI. Um, additionally, these patients are uh, much more likely to, to present with a uh, silent MI uh, than the general population because of uh, damage to the uh, nerve endings related to the radiation. Um, importantly, the, the distribution of the affected uh, coronary arteries depends on the, on the field of radiation. Um, so for example, uh, mediastinal radiation is, is usually associated with uh, LAD and RCA disease, um, whereas uh, left-sided breast cancer is more, uh, more commonly associated with just LAD disease. Um, additionally, the, the arterial uh, narrowing that we see with uh, um, uh, radiation uh, tends to be very proximal. Um, often involving the, uh, the coronary ostia. So here's a, um, a schematic drawing showing the, the effects of radiation on the, on the vasculature. Um, panel A up top shows a, a normal blood vessel with a, with a thin intima. Um, panels B and C show the, both the acute and the uh, chronic changes um, after uh, radiation with inflammation and uh, subsequent um, intimal uh, fibrosis. Uh, radiation initially causes an endothelial injury in the coronaries uh, that leads to a pro-inflammatory state, um, which eventually uh, damages blood vessels via oxidative stress uh, that ultimately uh, disrupts uh, DNA. Um, this, uh, this inflammatory cascade leads to ruptured blood vessel walls, um, platelet aggregation, thrombosis, uh, and replacement of the, the damaged uh, coronary intima um, by fi uh, fibroblasts, um, which ultimately accelerates vessel stenosis and uh, the development of uh, atherosclerosis, um, uh, which can lead to um, uh, uh, unusually severe coronary disease in uh, relatively um, young patients. Um, below are, are two uh, example CT images obtained from uh, patients who were treated with uh, radiation therapy for uh, left-sided uh, breast cancer um, on, the, on the left image, and then uh, for uh, uh, prostate cancer with uh, abdominal pelvic uh, radiation. So you can see the, um, the extent of the, the calcification and the damage in the blood vessels. Uh, throughout the body. Um, thoracic radiation is also uh, strongly associated with uh, valvulopathy uh, with a prev uh, prevalence of um, 
uh, 26% at 10 years and 60% at uh, 20 years following uh, completion of treatment. Um, the, the median interval between the, the diagnosis of cancer and uh, development of valvular heart disease is uh, about 23 years, um, with the, the prevalence and severity being uh, directly proportional to the dose of the, the radiation that the patient received. Um, with radiation, the valve cusps and leaflets undergo um, uh, fibrotic changes in thickening uh, with or without calcification. Um, mediastinal radiation uh, typically affects the, the left-sided valves um, regardless, regardless of the dose distribution, which uh, suggests that there is some effect of the um, uh, higher pressures on the, on the systemic uh, circulation. Um, aortic regurgitation uh, is the most commonly seen pathology followed by aortic stenosis. Um, we also typically uh, see aortomitral uh, continuity um, calcifications on echo as well. Uh, the, the top image here are some representative echo images um, showing a, a heavy, heavily calcified aortic valve um, and uh, uh, aortomitral curtain following radiation therapy. Um, the, the panel below was taken from a, a pathology study which assessed um, excised aortic valves of patients who had undergone TAVI um, comparing uh, uh, previous radiation subjects uh, from different cancers with controls. Um, interestingly, the, the valves of patients with the history of uh, prior lymphoma um, were, were found to have um, uh, decreased density um, increased collagen content and uh, less uh, calcified tissue than the other groups. Um, uh, these changes were, were attributed to the high doses of radiation uh, received at a young age in these patients and suggests that a, a, a different mechanism of valvulopathy even among uh, patients uh, uh, with a history of radiation therapy can, can happen. Uh, thoracic radiation has also been linked with a, a significantly increased risk of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Um, this is due to a, a variety of uh, uh, etiologies, including um, direct fibrosis of the myocardium, uh, hypertrophy secondary to valvular heart disease, and uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy. Um, patients are, are much more likely to present with uh, diastolic rather than systolic dysfunction uh, due to replacement of the myocardium with the fibrotic tissue. Um, and we, we often see uh, uh, involvement of the right ventricle as well due to its uh, um, anterior location. Uh, the prevalence depends uh, on the underlying cancer. Um, as patients with a history of Hodgkin's have been shown to have uh, significant diastolic dysfunction, roughly 15% of follow-up echoes, um, compared to patients with a history of uh, left-sided breast cancer treatment where the, the prevalence was over 50%. Um, additionally, uh, combined use of uh, cardiotoxic uh, chemotherapy regimen appears to confer a, a synergistic um, uh, risk uh, compared to either individually. Uh, radiation can cause a, a wide array of uh, pericardial disease as well, um, ranging from asymptomatic uh, pericardial calcifications, thickening, and effusions, which we uh, incidentally see on, on imaging, um, to heart failure uh, due to um, chronic uh, constrictive pericarditis. Um, you can also see presentations of uh, acute pericarditis and uh, cardiac tamponade. Um, uh, acute uh, pericarditis is uh, uh, a rare um, short-term complication um, of radiation-induced inflammation, um, and it's usually seen with uh, um, high doses of radiation uh, given in Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, in the long term, uh, there can be uh, impaired, impaired uh, venous drainage and accumulation of uh, uh, fibrinous exudate in the pericardial space, uh, which can result in a, pericardial, a chronic pericardial effusion. Um, calcification, thickening, and uh, uh, stiffening of the pericardium uh, can also lead to um, uh, constrictive pericarditis, uh, but that usually occurs decades after, after uh, radiation treatment. Lastly, in the, the heart specifically, um, uh, conduction abnormalities can be a, a, a rarer complication of radiation therapy. Um, with uh, roughly 5% of patients developing a, a, serious, um, a serious abnormality in their conduction system, uh, either due to um, uh, direct uh, fibrosis or 
uh, as a result of ischemia. Um, it's pretty common uh, to see ECG changes after um, radiation therapy, um, most notably uh, uh, is a, a right bundle branch block due to its uh, anterior location. Um, but uh, radiation has also been associated with uh, abnormal heart rate recovery after exercise, uh, prolonged QT interval, um, ventricular tachycardia, sinus node dysfunction, uh, and other AB uh, blocks and fascicular blocks. Outside the heart, um, uh, cardio uh, cardiologists should also be aware of um, the, the radiation effects in the, the head and neck and the abdomen and pelvis. Um, given the, the close proximity of the, the carotid sheath um, uh, with uh, lymphatic target structures in the, in the neck, um, radiation therapy has been associated with the increased risk of uh, uh, carotid artery stenosis, um, TIAs, and strokes. Uh, additionally, um, radiation therapy can uh, uh, result in pretty uh, significant autonomic dysfunction, which can manifest uh, as inappropriate sinus tack, uh, orthostatic um, hypotension, um, POTS, uh, and a blunted uh, uh, blood pressure response after exercise. Um, to give you a, a little bit of a sense of how these uh, how close these structures uh, often are to each other. Um, this picture is, uh, is taken from a, a radiation planning of a, a young patient with left uh, tonsillar um, carcinoma, which is uh, metastasized to a, a lymph node in the area outlined in blue. Um, the, uh, the red arrow here is pointing to the, uh, the carotid bulb. And as you can see, it's right, right in the middle of the uh, uh, treatment field. Um, based on the, the uh, uh, available data out there, um, therapeutic radiation to the abdomen and uh, uh, pelvis uh, can also lead to aortic and iliofemoral um, atherosclerosis, uh, as well as uh, stenosis of the um, renal artery, mesenteric artery, and uh, iliac vein. Um, due to uh, an absence of uh, specific screening uh, protocols related to this, the, the true incidence of this uh, uh, abdominal pelvic atherosclerotic disease after radiation therapy is a, is a bit un unknown. Um, uh, but we do know that uh, patients are at risk for developing uh, renovascular uh, hypertension because of this and uh, should be monitored closely. Hopefully by, uh, by this point, um, you can appreciate that there is a, uh, a significantly increased risk of a, a variety of uh, cardiovascular complications following um, radiation therapy. Uh, so what can we do as, as providers to help mitigate this risk for our patients long-term? Um, as I, I previously mentioned, uh, the, the two most important determinants in the development of um, radiation-induced heart disease are uh, the individual patient's under, uh, underlying cardiovascular risk um, and the, the dose of radiation therapy delivered to the cardiovascular structures. Um, uh, because of this, the, the two main guiding principles uh, in reducing um, cardiovascular sequela of radiation therapy are to identify and, um, uh, and optimize cardiovascular risk factors uh, and to minimize the amount of radiation delivered to the cardiovascular system without affecting uh, cancer outcomes. Um, obviously, from a, uh, from a, a cardiologist's perspective, we aren't uh, going to be able to um, uh, influence the, the second part of this. But one of the, the big uh, takeaways I want you to have from today is the, the uh, importance of our role in the first. Um, modifiable uh, risk factors are extremely prevalent in uh, middle-aged or older patients undergoing um, radiation therapy, as well as uh, adult survivors of uh, childhood radiation. Um, cardiovascular uh, risk factors, especially hypertension, have a uh, been shown have a, a sizable um, impact on subsequent uh, major cardiac events. Um, exercise has also been uh, specifically associated with improved mortality in, in childhood uh, cancer survivors. Um, paramount to uh, um, to disease prevention is is establishing a, a, a good set of guidelines with regard to to screening this population. Um, while we should always be using things like the, the ASCVD um, 
uh, MESA risk scores uh, to help risk stratify these patients, uh, it's important to acknowledge that um, uh, these likely underestimate uh, the risk in this population and don't always apply to our patients uh, as well based off their age. Um, fortunately, the uh, uh, recently the International Cardio-Oncology Society re uh, recently um, uh, released a uh, expert consensus statement uh, related to this. Um, I apologize for the, the small print and I won't go into to too much detail here, but wanted to, to show you that we do, um, we do have recently published guidelines as of, uh, uh, as of late last year um, uh, regarding uh, uh, screening recommendations for patients with a history of radiation therapy to the, the head and neck, uh, abdomen and pelvis or the, uh, uh, or the thorax. So here's a, um, a, a summary slide of these uh, same screening recommendation in a little bit easier to, uh, to read algorithm form. Um, so if you have a, a patient that's planned to receive any amount of uh, radiation, it's recommended that they um, undergo a, a comprehensive physical exam as well as uh, assessment and optimization of their uh, cardiovascular risk factors prior. Um, particular emphasis, I would say, on the guidelines is put on uh, blood pressure control um, and uh, reviewing any staging or treatment planning CTs uh, for the presence of coronary or other uh, vascular calcification. Um, there are no uh, there are no data currently to suggest that uh, radiation planning should be uh, altered based off the presence of pre-existing coronary calcifications or um, known underlying coronary disease. Um, although these patients would be expected to, to uh, derive uh, additional benefit from uh, um, optimal cardiovascular risk uh, reduction. Um, unless these patients have underlying cardiovascular disease, uh, again, this portion is likely uh, being done on the, uh, on the oncology side of things. Um, what is interesting is that they, uh, they do now recommend obtaining a, a baseline ECG and echocardiogram for any patients who are um, uh, scheduled to receive uh, thoracic radiation specifically, um, and we're all used to uh, doing uh, these pre-chemotherapy uh, echocardiograms, but uh, they're, they're now pushing to have it done for uh, prior to, to chest radiation as well to get a baseline. Um, following radiation therapy, it, it's recommended that uh, patients be seen at least annually for a uh, uh, a focused cardiovascular history and exam, again, with an emphasis on optimization of their cardiovascular risk factors and, and reviewing uh, available imaging. Um, depending on the, on the location of their radiation therapy, uh, you can see that they might recommend checking things like uh, orthostatics or, or performing a, a thorough vascular exam uh, at these visits. Um, while we don't have any uh, a specific long-term uh, screening recommendations following uh, abdominal pelvic uh, radiation, uh, they do recommend that high-risk patients um, who receive radiation to their head and neck region or thorax be followed uh, with either either a carotid ultrasound or an echocardiogram at the at the one-year mark. Um, again, uh, we would call someone uh, high risk based off of. Um, their, their underlying cardiovascular risk factors, uh, known baseline cardiovascular disease, or if they received a, a high cumulative um, dose of radiation above 30 grays um, or a, a, a fractionated dose of greater than two grays per day. Uh, regardless of their risk, it's, it's recommended that we obtain um, these for all patients uh, that receive radiation every five years. Um, also of note, uh, some sort of ischemic evaluation and BNP measurement uh, is recommended as well if they have a, a, a history of thoracic radiation specifically. The last part of the, the talk, I wanted to focus more on some of the um, uh, specific management uh, considerations with regard to these patients. So there are some uh, uh, unique differences and nuances uh, when compared to the, the general population. Um, management of uh, established radiation uh, cardiovascular disease poses uh, significant um, challenges, uh, in large part due to the, the radiation-induced changes to the, the surrounding tissue and the vasculature as well. 
Um, multiple studies have demonstrated an increased surgical mortality uh, following open heart surgery with radiation therapy. Uh, and it's actually been shown to be an um, a in independent risk factor uh, for death as well. Um, because of this, while it's not uh, necessarily true in all cases, um, percutaneous treatment uh, options are often considered uh, advantageous in this population. Uh, if surgery is ultimately being considered, uh, the, the patient should receive um, extensive counseling and uh, preoperative evaluation whenever possible, including um, echo, coronary angiography, CT scans, and uh, pulmonary function testing. Um, additionally, if there's any concern for uh, constriction or restriction, uh, there should be a strong consideration given for obtaining a, a cardiac MRI and a, a simultaneous uh, right and left heart cath. Looking at the, um, uh, the management of um, aortic valve disease specifically, it's important to realize that um, uh, patients with a, a history of prior chest radiation and severe aortic stenosis have uh, worse outcomes with any type of uh, uh, valve intervention when compared to controls. Um, that said, uh, there's been several um, retrospective studies uh, that do seem to show uh, improved outcomes with uh, TAVI when compared to a, a surgical valve replacement. Um, one, one such study was uh, uh, published in 2019. It showed that um, TAVI had uh, less uh, adjusted 30-day all-cause mortality. Um, as well as less uh, post-operative atrial fibrillation and shorter hospitalizations when compared to um, uh, surgical aortic valve replacement. Um, of note in this study, uh, subgroup analysis of uh, patients with uh, low surgical risk um, showed that uh, patients treated with uh, SAVR could have uh, potentially favorable outcomes. Uh, but the study also showed that the, uh, the STS score um, uh, underestimates the 30-day the mortality risk in uh, radiation patients as well, which can make um, uh, risk assessment a bit difficult. Um, based on the, the available data, uh, the, the consensus guidelines have recommended TAVI as the, as the default intervention for, for all patients at intermediate or high risk. Um, that said, the SAVR is still an option and, and should be considered in, um, in patients at, at lower surgical risk, uh, younger age, um, especially in those uh, with any technical or uh, anatomical concerns uh, related to the TAVI. Um, uh, additionally, in those patients that require uh, additional surgical uh, interventions, such as uh, a pericardiectomy, uh, multiple valve interventions, or, uh, um, or cabbage. Um, here's one, uh, one of the published treatment uh, algorithms uh, that focuses on uh, uh, management of the, the aortic valve disease specifically in the setting of um, uh, other valvular heart disease or, or coronary disease as well. Um, in terms of uh, uh, coronary disease management, uh, the, the outcomes of PCI um, are actually uh, pretty similar um, to those with or without a history of radiation therapy, surprisingly. Um, while the data is pretty limited, there's, there's no evidence at this point to suggest that um, radiation therapy is associated with any increased risk of uh, stent failure, regardless if it's performed before or after the, the radiation. Um, Similar to, to other surgical options uh, for these patients, uh, cabbage um, can present challenges. Uh, issues such as uh, subclavian artery stenosis, as well as uh, atresia of the lima can occur, which uh, limit the availability of the, uh, uh, this bypass conduit. Um, uh, other bypass graft options are also um, often hampered by a, a severely calcified um, aorta. Um, in general, uh, among patients with uh, radiation-induced uh, heart disease, uh, ma which uh, manifests as uh, uh, chronic coronary disease, the, the management indications uh, should follow established um, recommendations, uh, though do seem to, to uh, favor PCI when feasible. 
um, patients with one or two uh, uh, vessel coronary disease uh, should preferentially undergo PCI. Um, but the, the presence of multivessel disease, left main disease, uh, diabetes, or high syntax score uh, presents a, a little bit more of a um, management conundrum and uh, should involve a, a multidisciplinary discussion. Um, lastly, uh, um, patients uh, with a history of radiation-induced heart disease presenting with ACS should be uh, preferentially um, uh, treated with PCI, um, especially in their, during their index uh, hospitalization. Um, just to wrap things up, uh, here's a, a summary um, diagram of, uh, of the big things that we discussed this morning. Um, again, the, the two... Uh, most important uh, determinants for the development of the radiation-induced heart disease are the patient's underlying risk factors and the, the dose and the volume of the radiation that's delivered. Um, because of this, uh, our focus uh, as cardiologists need to be on uh, identifying these patients and um, optimizing their risk factors. Um, while there have been uh, significant improvements with regard to the, uh, the safety profile and delivery uh, of radiation therapy over the years, it, it remains a, a major cause of uh, cardiac morbidity and mortality uh, in, in cancer patients. Um, fortunately, the, uh, the recently published uh, guidelines uh, late last year helped to give us some framework for how to best uh, approach and follow these patients. Uh, and finally, um, uh, if these patients progress to, to clinically significant heart disease, it's important to remember that there are um, unique management considerations and, and nuances when compared to the, the general population, and often a, uh, a multidisciplinary approach is warranted. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop here. A special thank you to, to Richard uh, for his mentorship over the past year. Um, there's a obligatory uh, family photo, uh, the group that's put up with me throughout the course of my training. Um, stop here and take any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Feller. That was such a wonderful overview on radiation just cardiovascular disease. And I completely agree. I mean, I think a lot of this is really increasing awareness because these patients clearly are increased long-term risk and management needs to differ based on their history. So it looks like we have a question from Jay Voigt. Um, are certain cardiac cell types more vulnerable to radiation than others? And what type of radiation-induced disease has been the most challenging to manage in clinic? So I guess let's separate that to those two questions. So I guess the first one is, are certain cell types more vulnerable to radiation? Uh, not that I saw in the... Um, uh, um, any of the research that, it, that I did related to this, you know, the uh, vascular structures seem to be uh, the most at risk um, for this, uh, um, but the, um, uh, the cells in the myocardium, uh, uh, in the valves, uh, they certainly um, uh, can develop fibrosis as well, but um, there, there didn't seem to be any uh, propensity for one, way, one, area, uh, one cell type or the other. Yeah, and I would say I think that's a very um, difficult question clinically. Um, right now, a lot of the focus, so when patients undergo radiation therapy, typically they will give you the total radiation dose. Um, from a cardio-oncology standpoint, what's really most pertinent is the mean heart dose, um, but that is not actually always um, sort of presented in the data that the radiation oncologist will provide. In general, if you go back and ask them, they can give your radiation map. It's actually very easy to ascertain. But I think the challenge is it's not routinely presented. And even when they give you a mean heart dose, it's usually for the total hearts. They usually don't give it um, based on regional variation. Um, so I can tell you it's one of the things that we've been trying to look at. And the, there's a study called Ray Comp where women with breast cancer getting radiation therapy or fall prospectively. And we're trying to separate out the various cardiac regions to see if certain exposures may be higher risk than others. But at the end of the day, it's still on the clinical level and not necessarily on the cellular level. So um, Jay's second question is, what type of radiation-induced disease has been the most challenging to manage? Um, I guess, it, you know, I've, I've been doing this a year for Richard, and I would say that the, uh, the challenging thing that I've run into is not any one of them in, uh, in particular. It's the, it's the fact that they seem to um, present with uh, all of them uh, at once. 
Um, and that could just be my, you know, my N of five that I've, I've seen with Richard, but you know, these patients don't, uh, at least in my experience have, you know, isolated, um, coronary disease or isolated valvular disease. It's, it, it's, uh, generally a, a combination of these. Um, so I, I haven't noticed that any one of the, the issues is, uh, any easier to, um, correct than the other. It's, uh, often trying to, uh, to fix them in combination, especially when they're um, uh, a lot younger and having to, uh, you know, have those discussions with them. Great. And, and I would echo those comments. I, I think particularly for patients who get mantle radiation, you have to remember the entire heart essentially gets exposed. So oftentimes they'll have concurrent disease involving multiple different areas. And because of that, it's very difficult to really focus on one. So I would say the most challenging patients are the ones with multifocal disease. And, and sometimes we consider transplant as, you know, you know, Dr. Phil and I had a patient recently that we, from Alaska, that we referred for transplant for this reason. Um, so it looks like we have some additional questions here. We have a question from Lyle. What considerations should be entertained when radiation is applied to hearts with implantable hardware? For example, patients with Watchmen, um, ASD closure devices, and um, ICDs, for example. And, and I think I, I would sort of uh, preface that question by stating that it's a little, I would say the type of device is a little bit different in terms of what you have to worry about. Is it b before or after? I, I think it's um, for patients with existing devices, is there certain considerations you have to take when they receive radiation? Um, I do not, I did not know the, uh, the, the answer to that. I didn't come across uh, um, I didn't come across that in, in the in my reading on the on the topic. Yeah, I, I would say that's more kind of in the active treatment phase. So there isn't much data on, for example, structural devices such as Watchmen, um, Mitroclips, Tavers, AC closure devices, and, and I don't think that's so much concern for um, ICDs and pacemakers in particular. There is some concern for resets. Um, I know, for example, Chris Pan has done a lot of work on this, and this is not necessarily related to cumulative exposure. It's more related to the energy level where higher energy levels um, and neutron production is going to increase your risk for device resets. So I know sometimes in EP, for example, um, if your patient is a pacemaker and they receive radiation, um, then they would need the device to get moved um, if they're felt to be high risk. And it looks like Chris has a comment here. Um, can we have her talk or should I just read what she wrote? Uh, I guess I was real what she wrote. So um, there's, it's generally low risk and there is an HRS consensus statement on this and risk is associated with total beam energy. Great, so let's move on. Um, so from Dr. Linker, this is a very nice overview for a general cardiologist seeing these patients after treatment for cancer. It sounds like the specific issues to be aware of are an increased index of suspicion for all these issues and a bias against surgical interventions. Or are there other issues that general cardiologists should be aware of? Um, no, I, I think that's the that's the big stuff. You know, I, I think that the you know, in all of the the reading I did with the, the these patients are um, it's a it's an additive risk. You know, having uh, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and these patients are at a at a, a higher risk than the uh, the general population. And so I think. Um, especially in younger patients too, at least in my experience, you know, they, they may get a little bit of a pass for a, um, a borderline blood pressure or a, um, a borderline cholesterol. But I, I think being more vigilant uh, with these patients and, um, uh, and really aggressively uh, uh, going after their, um, their risk factors with, you know, blood pressure, cholesterol, um, diabetes control, and any type of uh, um, uh, family history. Um, and certainly, you know, it does seem like there is a, uh, there is a bias against um, uh, surgical uh, uh, treatment options for these patients. But, you know, as we were talking about the, um, a lot of times that, you know, Richard said with the, the mantle cell radiation, they often have a, a lot of different things going on. And in those cases, it actually may be uh, beneficial to, to send the patient to the OR uh, one time to um, you know, hopefully uh, address all of those, all of those issues at once. I think that's great. And it looks like we have a question from Melish Thompson. It would seem that chest fibrosis is the negative factor to decide regarding surgery. 
is MRI for fibrosis quantification necessary or helpful to choose a surgical option in terms of, I guess, surgical versus percutaneous approach? Uh, I did not see that they used um, uh, chest MRI um, prior to any, um, uh, any type of uh, um, uh, surgical evaluation. I know they use uh, chest CT um, uh, frequently, and I think they can get um, some idea um, uh, of, of the lay of the land. But I think a lot of times they go into these operations uh, um, expecting, expecting the worst, expecting a lot of calcification or friable tissue. Um, uh, but I, I didn't come across any uh, preoperative uh, MRI evaluations. Yeah, and no, I agree with that. I, I, I think the risk isn't so much related to specifically myocardial fibrosis as opposed to um, overt macrovascular um, changes as well as scarring calcification. So oftentimes surgeons would do a CT to see how much um, sort of scar tissue there is because the concern is really during the surgical approach, there is a very high risk for bleeding um, more so than concern for, um, I would say specifically cardiac dysfunction due to fibrosis. But you're correct. I mean, there's probably going to be some benefit, I guess, if you quantify the extracellular volume, I'll give you an idea of uh, subclinical cardiac dysfunction. But I don't think it's something that's routinely looked at. Great. And it looks like those are most of our questions. I, I actually do have a question for you, Kyle, which is more of a practical question. So you showed a lot of the guidelines in terms of surveillance for these patients longitudinally. I think one of the challenges is that a lot of these patients, because they present so late, they don't routinely follow with cardiology and they're kind of in a realm of their PCP. So I think one question I have for you is from a systems approach, how do we reconcile and harmonize this barrier to follow up? Since a lot of these patients, for example, they're doing fine from you know, cancer, they've got radiation, 10 years later, they're unlikely to be seeing their oncologist or cardiology anymore. Um, and oftentimes they won't get the needed surveillance. Yeah, it is a, uh, it's certainly an issue. And I, I think, um, you know, some of the onus will fall on the, the oncology um, uh, side of things. Cause I, I think that they're going to be the ones that are um, uh, regularly seeing these patients uh, and monitoring these things. Um, they're, you know, the, the consensus statements that I found in a lot of the uh, the, um, the treatment uh, guidelines and algorithms were all on the um, uh, the cardio oncology side of things, and I you know I, I didn't come across a lot of um, uh, data in the literature as far as the uh, oncologic um, screening uh, recommendations, and so you know you're 100 correct that it's uh, a lot of these patients I think get um, lost to follow up, especially if they had um, you know, treatment for Hodgkin's when they were young, uh, and they don't present for, for decades later. Um, you know, hopefully, um, as you know, that as far as I'm aware, this is the the only guidelines uh, that were that have been published uh, related to this. And so, hopefully, as you know, more guidelines come out um, uh, and they become a, a bit more mainstream, uh, the um, uh, you know primary care physicians, oncologists will become a little bit more versed in. Um, the long-term risk with this and identifying uh, which patients need to be, um, you know, ultimately referred for uh, cardiac evaluation. Great. Thank you. Um, so, so I think, you know, I think those are very important insights. Um, I think in the interest of time, since it's nearly 8.30, um, we should probably end here. Um, Dr. Feller, thank you again for such a wonderful talk, and it's been a great year working with you. Um, I look forward to continue um, working with you next year when you move on to Polyclinic. Thank everyone for attending us. Have a great day.